Okay, we'll start letting people into the study. Hello, everybody. Can can you hear me? Good. Yes. Excellent. Well, you might you might want to put yeah put on uh, on mute. That keeps the noise down a little bit. Unless you need to say something. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start. I usually. Wait a few minutes for people to come in, but uh, I want to end a little bit early. Normally, we go about um, uh, it, it till about eight fifteen uh, with questions, but I want to let in by by eight uh, today. So let's go ahead and say a prayer. We'll probably have some more people come in, but we'll do a prayer, and uh, we'll keep rolling. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. O oh Lord, our God, who knows that we can do nothing without your guidance and help assist us, we pray, direct us into divine wisdom, that everything that we do will be good for our salvation, for the benefit of others, and to the glory of thy holy name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Okay. So uh, we are going to talk today, really start talking about worship. Uh, we talked about uh, the temple architecture and the tabernacle and the temple architecture, the worship space, how that relates to our worship space in the church. We talked about the priesthood, uh, and all of this is really Setting us, up, setting us up for asking the question, how do we worship? And how do we uh, worship specifically as, as the people, the priesthood of believers within the church? And how does the, the priest participate in that worship? So that's what we're going to talk about this evening. And uh, I want to read something, actually a few things I want to do before we start here. One uh, announcement I have is that some of you are familiar with a prayer book called the Pocket Prayer Book, and there is a new edition of this that has come out. And I, I just got this at the Antiochian Village in Pennsylvania, which is, is where we really have our kind of official archdiocese bookstore. So uh, this is pretty cool because the priests have a book that we use that has uh, many of our usual services in it. It's called the Liturgicon, and I will be using that book as we go through the services and talk about worship. But uh, we, there's also a book that is being published for priests that will make it a little simpler for us to, uh, to serve some services. There is a new pew book that is coming out for the people to follow along and to see the services uh, and the pocket prayer book. So all of these things, what uh, they allow us to do is create a uniformity in our language, because if you look at a lot of different liturgical books, they have uh, very different, not very different, but they have different translations of things. And, and that sometimes can be a little confusing if you've ever been in a group and tried to sing the Treparian of the cross there is a point where you have to split off into one of like three different versions so uh god is saving the commonwealth or his people or and, you know defeating uh the barbarians or something you know so there's a lot of different um different versions of that and and it's really conforming also to the text that we use when we chant the normal text that we use when we chant so it's really nice. So they really uh, edited this, added some things. Uh, some of the things that used to be in there are probably not in here, but uh, they put a lot of thought into this little pocket prayer book. So, and uh, eventually we'll get those in the bookstore at St. George. I also want to mention, since we're talking about worship, a, a new book 
that has been published called Welcoming Gifts, Sacrifice in the Bible and Christian Life by Father uh, Jeremy Davis. You may be seeing this in reverse uh, on your screen, but uh, we don't have this, I think, at the St. George Bookstore yet either, but we need to have it. This is a, a new book, really, on what sacrifice is. And uh, this is the second book, I think, published recently, um, or at least the second source that I've run across in the past year or two, that really makes the point that sacrifice is not killing an animal. Sacrifice is an offering. And when an animal is killed, you have to kill the animal to make the offering, right? To make the sacrifice. Uh, and, and in our culture, when we talk about sacrifice, we often mean someone dying for, uh, you know, a, a purpose. Um, but this is written by Father, as I said, Father Jeremy Davis. He was in our diocese for a long time, and then he was tapped to work at the archdiocese. And he is now what is called the Protosingulos. The Protosingulos is essentially the first priest among all the priests uh, in North America in our Antiochian archdiocese. So he works right very closely with the, um, with the archbishop, with the metropolitan. That's a really good book that uh, I hope to dive into a little bit uh, more here soon. So as we start tonight, I want to read something about the priesthood. This is from St. John Chrysostom. He's uh, here speaking about the glory of the priesthood. The work of the priesthood is done on earth, but it is ranked among heavenly ordinances. And this is only right, for no man, no angel, no archangel, no other created power, but the paraclete himself ordained the succession and persuaded men while still remaining in the flesh to represent the ministry of angels. The priest, therefore, must be as pure as if he were standing in heaven itself in the midst of those powers. So this is, uh, this is about the high calling of the priesthood. The priest is on earth, and yet he's doing heavenly work. So we're going to talk about what really the priest does and the people. And I may have mentioned before in the, in the Orthodox Church, if we're going to have a divine liturgy, the priest cannot do that without people. There has to be at least somebody else there. There's no such thing as like a private divine liturgy because we need uh, the, the, the priesthood and the people, right, to, to have the church. And the priest, remember, really is the representative of of the bishop when the bishop is not not present so we're going to talk today about this ministry of worship as i said before really technically uh the word ministry a narrow definition is to to liturgize right it is the work of the priest to minister and that's what we see in scripture when we see uh ministry in scripture sometimes. So where I want to start is in chapter 16 of Leviticus, because I want to talk about Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And we're going to see what this is about. So I'm going to start with 16.1. This is really giving us a foundation for understanding the work of Christ, because we always have to look, we start with the uh, the Old Testament, right? It, it leads up to what Christ fulfills. And then that ministry of Christ is really the ministry of the church. So, right, the priesthood that uh, the priest and the bishop that we share in, uh, and I mean, the deacon is a rank of the priesthood, right, as well. Uh, that ministry that we share in at the holy altar is is, is the, the ministry of Christ, right? It's the priesthood of Christ. So we're going to go back to the Old Testament. Look at this. 16.1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons when they offered strange fire before the Lord and died. 
And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil in the presence of the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony, lest he die. So remember that you have the, the holy place. That is where there was a, a table with, with uh, 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. There was a lampstand, seven branch lampstand. And uh, this and the and incense was offered before the veil, and beyond the veil was the holy of holies or the the most holy place, right? The inner sanctuary, which was the holy holiest place in the world. That's where God's throne stood. That is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And on the top of the Ark of the Covenant is often translated as as mercy seat. Uh, and remember, there are two gold statues of cherubim overshadowing the mercy seat. And that, that is God's throne. So he's telling uh, the uh, telling Aaron, the high priest, not you just can't go into the holy place uh, inside the veil in the presence of the mercy seat in the ark. All right, lest, lest you die. You can't do that just any time. For I will be seen in the cloud above the mercy seat. Right, so the, uh, above this, uh, this, this, this uh, solid gold top that was on the ark, that's where the the cloud of God's presence would be. Right, God would appearing as cloud. Thus, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a young bull of the oxen as a sin offering and a ram as a whole burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash, and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments, therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. Right? So we have him vesting, right? putting on special clothing in order to approach right? the king of the universe. Then he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering. So kids being goats. Uh, as a as a sin offering and one ram as a whole burnt offering and Aaron shall offer the young bull as his sin offering to make atonement for himself and his house. We will see as we go through the liturgy, uh, the priest in the divine liturgy prays for himself, right? As and in order to uh, make this offering. Uh, that he's making really that's the offering of all all the people present he shall take two kids and present them before the lord at the door of the tabernacle of testimony and then aaron shall cast lots for the two kids one lot for the lord and the other lot for the scapegoat aaron shall bring the kid on which the lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering but the kid on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to let it go as the scapegoat into the desert, right? So we have one goat that is going to be a sacrifice offered to the Lord, and you're going to have a goat that is going to be released out into the wilderness. Then Aaron shall offer the young bull as his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his house. Thus he shall kill the young bull as a sin offering, he shall then take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of incense compound, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil, right? So he's, the, the high priest is going inside the veil with a lot of incense, like filling it up with smoke. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat on the testimonies lest he die. Right, he can't look upon upon God. So uh, we upon you know God's God's presence appearing as cloud. So he has this this all of this incense and this smoke filling the place, so that he um, does not look upon it. And this this teaches, of course, humility. Right, God is teaching the Israelites. He's there with them. Right, the God of the universe has set up his temple, uh, his tent, among their tents, in the center of 
their nation, really not just symbolically, but they camped around it in an organized way. It was the center of their camp. So, and and the, the God of the universe, his, his throne is there, right? He's very near to them, but he's not, not familiar, right? Like the, like the foreign gods in the same way he's holy. By familiar, I mean, he, he's not uh, ordinary, right? We, they treat him as, as God, right? He's ho- as a holy God. So this is teaching that he, he's there with them, and yet he is, he is holy. Uh, four, 14, I should take uh, some of the young bull's blood with his finger and sprinkle it upon the east side of the mercy seat seven times. So notice how he's using blood. He's sprinkling the blood. After that, he shall kill the kid of the sin offering before the Lord on behalf of the people and bring some of its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the young bull and sprinkle it upon the east side of the mercy seat seven times. So he shall make atonement in the holy place because of the impurities and injustices of the children of Israel for all their sins. And thus he shall do this in the tabernacle of testimony built among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Right? So the people sin. Right in the high priest sins. So the high priest, he uh, offers this blood for the purification of his sins, makes this offering of blood. And uh, the offering of blood is made for the goat that is sacrificed. It is made for the sins of all the people because God is with them. They are his people, but because they sin, right? He's in the midst of this, of, of these people. And there's also a, um, you know, ceremonial uncleanness and the, these things ceremonial uncleanness really has to do with those things that pertain to our fallen state as human beings it's not necessarily sin but things that relate to um, our you say our fleshliness our kinship with the animals and we are coming into the presence of of the god who is right above uh far above humanity anything anything like that anything like the other gods the nations right that that they imagined being sort of like human, but higher, right? Uh, it's nothing like that. And But God is providing a way right within the law for this, this purification, right? And, uh, you know, often you hear in Protestantism that, um, you know, th- this emphasis that we couldn't keep the law, uh, I mean, the law points out sin, and uh, it's, tr- it's true, we're not going to live like perfectly according to the law. And yet, keeping the law also has to do uh, with purifying yourself if you do sin, right? So, so the worship of Israel was uh, also about this constant being able to restore uh, relationship with God. Okay, so in verse 17, there shall be no man in the tabernacle of testimony when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and he may make atonement for himself, his household and all the congregation of the children of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar before the Lord. And I mentioned, you know, he took the coals from the altar. Remember that's this, uh, this fire, this, and, and it's a holy fire that is burning at the altar for sacrifice. Then he shall go out to the altar before the Lord and make atonement upon it. And he shall take some of the blood of both the young bull and the kid and put it in the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse and sanctify it because of the impurities of the children of Israel. Right? So we see that that's, you know, sin uh, cause it causes um, it affects things, right? It causes impurity, right? Sin produces death. and, and And we see death as sort of this, uh, sort of this disease, right? This sort of infection. And notice that blood is, that is sanctified to God. It is purifying, right? That's how blood is used. It is, it is, it is purifying. In fact, it's, it's, it's used in a very similar way to the way we use holy water today, right? We, we uh, use holy water to purify, to spiritually purify. And of course, blood is special. It's, 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 it's uh, as we know, right in our worship. 
it is uh, there's something about blood that make that's when it's sanctified that makes it powerful. And we're and I'm going to go over a little bit about that. So so we have this this goat right that is uh, that is sacrificed for the uh, sins of the people. And now let's look at this other goat. Remember, one goat was chosen to be offered to the Lord. Uh, and uh, then we have the, the scapegoat that we're going to talk about. When Aaron shall finish making atonement in the holy place, the tabernacle of testimony and the altar, and shall also cleanse matters concerning the priest, and then he shall bring the living kid. Again, this is a goat. Spoiler alert. You know. uh, Aaron uh, shall place his hands on the head of the living kid. Right? So Aaron, Aaron is putting his hands, right? on on the goat that that the one not the one sacrificed not the one dedicated as holy that is sacrificed as an offering to god this is the other goat he places his hands on this goat aaron shall place his hands on the head of the living kid confess over it all the transgressions of the children of israel and all their lawlessness and all their sins and he shall put them on the head of the living kid and send it away into the desert by the hand of a suitable man the kid shall bear on itself all their wrongdoing to an uninhabitable land thus he shall send away the kid into the desert then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of testimony and take off the linen garments he put on when he went into the holy place and he shall leave them there he shall then wash his body with water in holy place, put on his garments, and come out to offer this whole burnt offering and the whole burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself, his house, the people, and matters concerning the priest. The fat of the sin offering he shall offer on the altar. He who sent away the kid, which was set apart for a mission, shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. Right? This man who went out and took this, right, the, the, the dirty goat, right, the one that all of the sins have been placed on this goat, and that goat has been sent away into the wilderness, right? This is the God who separates our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. The young bull and the kid for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall be carried outside the camp, and they shall burn them in the fire, their skin, their flesh, and their offal. Then he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that um, in the West, there's this idea that, and I used to teach this myself, this idea that, that uh, you know, a priest transfers sin or a person transfers their sin onto this animal and then the animal is killed which is the sacrifice right because the wages of sin is death so you deserve to die but this animal like dies for you right but here we see that the animal that has the sins placed upon it is sent out of the camp once the sins are on it, right, it's no longer a pure offering, right? You have to offer the, 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 uh, the goat, the other goat, right, as a pure offering. Remember, I mean, offerings that were offered to God were supposed to be like the best, right? These unspotted offerings. And, and this other goat, the scapegoat, that was more than a spotted offering, right? A blemished offering. It contained the sins and it was sent out into the desert, right? And the other goat, the, um, a portion of it was was offered right so so the one goat was offered as um as an offering to god and the other one was was the scapegoat that was sent out so um yeah 17 let's talk about this a second because this explains some things right, about blood now the lord spoke to moses saying speak to aaron his sons and all the children of israel and say to them this is the thing the lord commanded saying Whatever man of the children of Israel or resident aliens dwelling among them 
kill a young bull, a sheep or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of testimony to offer it as a whole offering and a whole burnt offering or a peace offering to the Lord acceptable for a sweet aroma. And whatever man kills outside and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of testimony so as to offer it as a gift to the Lord before the Lord's tabernacle, blood shall be reckoned to that man for he has shed blood. And that man shall be utter, utterly destroyed from among the people. That the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, they kill in the fields to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of testimony to the priest and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. The priest shall pour the blood upon the altar all around before the Lord at the doors of the tabernacle of testimony and offer the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to worthless things after whom they prostituted themselves this shall be an ordinance forever for you throughout your generations, right? So there is, there is one proper place to offer an offering and, and, and one to whom to offer that offering, and that is the true and living God, and that, that is necessary. So if we look at this, uh, in this, this particular section, it gives us this sense next about the importance of blood, the centrality of blood, what it means. And whatever man of the children of Israel or of the resident aliens dwelling among you eats any blood, I will set my face against that soul who eats blood and will utterly destroy him from among his people. For the life of all flesh is in its blood. And I give it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins, for its blood makes atonement for the soul, right? So blood is the, uh, in some ways, like the, the visible life force, right, of an animal. And, and what, we're, what this is about is really restoring life, right? So blood is not something, um, they can't just like drink the blood, you know, eat the blood of an animal. First of all, we're not animals, right? Now, this is interesting, right? If we eat the blood of an animal, that makes us very, um, uh, and we understand it's this life force. Like, we don't want the life of an animal within us, right? What we really want, um, if it were even possible, would to have the blood of God. We want to be like God, right? Again, spoiler alert. Here we go. So, we see how, how precious blood is and blood being part of this uh, this day of atonement, right? Which is this uh, day in which the sins of the people, the day for atonement, turning for the sins of the people. Uh, and I could talk a lot. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but a lot about even this this concept of uh, atonement. But what I want to do now is is turn ourselves now to the New Testament. And uh, a, a few things I want to go over with the teachings of Christ. So we're going to turn to Christ as being the priest, right? And the first thing to understand Christ as being priest is we have to recognize the importance of the incarnation, right? Since we're talking about blood, because in the incarnation, the one who is uncreated, Right, the one who made all things, because he loves us, took on our human nature, took on our flesh and blood in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and was born one of us. So he is God, and he is the, the king, the Messiah. He is the prophet. He is the priest. He fulfills all of these things. Right? So... Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this, but the incarnation is the fact that, he, that, that God became a human being. This is extremely important. You know, sometimes in the West, one of the reasons uh, it, it seems that uh, the theology seems a little thin is that the, the incarnation is really undervalued. Right? The cross is important. But the incarnation and how that, that relates to the cross is often undervalued. In fact, the <laughs> resurrection sometimes seems a little uh, undervalued. And, uh, and for us, we can't talk about the cross 
without talking about the resurrection, right? Even, even when, we're, when we're looking at the cross and we're looking at Christ in the tomb, we're always pointing toward the, the resurrection, which is the, the fulfillment of what the cross is about and the fulfillment of what the incarnation is about, right? The raising up of human nature. So I want to talk about right now, I want to go to Luke, but this is found in uh, Matthew and Mark as well. But we'll talk about the mystical supper, what's called the last supper in the West. And uh, let me start with 22. This is Luke 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered a city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, follow him into the house, which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it, as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you, be, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. So here we have this institution of the Eucharist. And we see the word Passover used over and over and over here by Luke. And this is connecting us, of course, with, with the Passover. Um, and who can tell me what the Greek, in, in the Old Testament, what the Greek word for Passover is? Pascha. Pascha, yes. So Pascha is... I went out on a Passover. limb on that. <laughs> uh, you know, for us, it's, not, it's, it's a Passover right from death to life. That's, that's, it's the fulfillment of the old Pascha. And interestingly, uh, here we see again this emphasis on on passover and um in the gospel of john so what what is passover passover uh, what we call the passover meal right the seder uh requires the lamb right and we see here uh now the feast of unleavened bread drew near which is called passover um I'll let me go down when, then came the day of unleavened bread when the passover must be killed, right? So we see this emphasis, but um, if we look at John, John, whose chronology we follow in the church liturgically, makes the point that the Passover lamb, when that Passover lamb is 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 uh, killed, that's on Friday. And that is when Christ is crucified, right? So Christ is a Passover lamb. And uh, so the big question is, right, is this, is this meal really the Passover, the Passover meal, right? As we think about the symbolic meal that is required, uh, you know, in the, um, in the Old Testament that is kept through, throughout the generations. And uh some have uh, suggested that it is the Passover meal, but it is it is just early, right on Thursday. So uh, there there are a lot of different opinions about this. None of that really matters, right? Because 
this Passover meal, what it's doing is instituting uh, the Eucharist. And we know that uh, this Passover is sort of the shadow, right, as a Passover meal, it was a shadow of something, but Christ becomes the Passover, right? He becomes the Passover lamb. And, and Pascha, right, is this fulfillment of Passover from death to life. So in, in, the, in the Fathers, you see a lot of different uh, interpretations. You know, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels, which means kind of to see things with one eye. And, and John is that Gospel, which uh, is often very different. Like with this, this supper, what he talks about is Christ washing feet right, in the Gospel of John, and uh, he, he really takes us right to these theological heights about what is going on, what is really happening uh, behind what we would see maybe as the historical narrative, right, uh, and, but, but also John in some ways is, is, very, is very specific about certain things with a lot of, a lot of details, so, um, but John really gives us this uh, real theological depth or theological height, however you want to think about um, with these things. So this is the Eucharist. And, and I also want to mention from the Gospel of John, Jesus's words, right? When, when, we, when we put into context what is, um, what is happening, right, in this, in this meal, he talked about this, right? He talked about this. So in, in John 6, 43, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. And let me, let me go before, let me start at 30. I want to give the context here. It even goes even before that to about verse 22. I'm going to start in 30. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everything who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Right? When we think about seeing the Father, remember, since Christ is God, he shares the same essence as the Father, right? So he knows the, the Son and the Holy Spirit know the Father on a level that only they know the Father, right? There's a, the Greek word called perichoresis is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit entirely in, interpenetrate one another, right? And know one another. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. 
that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He says it again. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Right? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascended where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But these are some of you who do not believe. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, and who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it is it has been granted to him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Still today, some people say this is a hard saying, right? Now, for those who stuck in there, what do they witness? They witness Christ's crucifixion. They witness Christ's resurrection. They witness the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they experience the life of the church and the worship of the church, where this is uh, a continuing part of the reality of the church. If we think about it, and I said this before, you remember the cross, Christ makes the cross the tree of life and his body and blood, that's the fruit of the tree. And those who eat from the tree of life will live forever. But he reopens paradise. And, and also with the resurrection, we, which, in which his, his flesh and blood were, uh, were raised in mortality, right? And they got to witness that, the flesh and blood of Christ raised in mortality and, and to ascend into heaven, right? So, and it goes back to the, the physicality of our worship too, right? Our, our worship is, it, it brings together the spiritual realm and the physical realm. So now I want to go to back to Hebrews, right? Because Hebrews, all this is intertwined, talking about the, the architecture, right? The, the temple on earth is really a reflection of the heavenly reality. That's true of our, our churches, right? It's a reflection of the heavenly reality. And the, um, we have talk of the priesthood of Christ being the priest. Remember, he's not uh, the priest of Aaron. He is not, because of the, if you look at the line of Aaron, like a priest would die, right? You, and you would need like the next generation of priests. But Christ, he, he's like Melchizedek in the Old Testament, who shows up without any like genealogy for him becoming a priest. And, and, and we get no image of what happened after Melchizedek. And this is this this image of Christ, right? The one who really has no genealogy because he's God, right? In his divine nature. And who is a priest forever because he really has no end. Right? And he's a human being and God, 
right? And and like like Melchizedek, um, so Melchizedek offered to the Most High God, but Christ is 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 the offer. Uh, he's the one who offers. He is the offered, and and he's God, right? So he's the one, even as God, who receives the offering. If you think about. Um, uh, I mean, the father, the person of the father receives the offer, but if we think about him as being God, right, he's the one uh, who is worshiped. So we have the, really the perfect priest and the king of Salem, uh, Melchizedek, he was the king and priest and Christ fulfills this, right? So we have this, if we look at, uh, let's see where we could start. There, there are so many places uh, to start, but let's look at, uh, let's start with chapter 8 here and see where we get here. Now, this is the main point of such things that we are saying. I think we covered this last time a little bit. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, right? The right hand of God the Father, a minister, right? Minister being the liturgist, right? The one who's performing the liturgy of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, right? I mean, even when Christ was a child, right? Who were their priests? They were the, you know, right? As an Israelite, they were the, uh, the priests of Aaron, right? But what did the priests of Aaron do? They serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises, right? So again, they the have this new covenant. And the reason Christ can mediate that he can bring together God and man is because he is in his person, God and man. Only he can do it. So I'm going to jump to nine. I went over some of this before. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances and divine services and the earthly sanctuary for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary and behind it, the veil and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, the holy of holies, the most holy place, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were golden, uh, in which was the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets in the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, of which things we cannot now speak in detail. Right. So this this is explaining what's going on. Now, this is what, what, is, what Christ is doing. This is, this is verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption is freedom, like freeing a slave. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is something greater. This, the, the sanctification that comes through this offering, the perfect priest, right, is offering the perfect sacrifice himself. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance, eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there also there must also of necessity be the death of the tester, the testator. For a testament is in force after the men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood, for in Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law. He took the blood of calves and goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded. 
So this is talking about what Moses did. Now, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heaven in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to offer to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages. So all of those, those blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, those all were shadows of the one who would come, the, per, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect priest, the, the one who is the perfect priest who would offer himself, the perfect sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. One sacrifice. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after the judgment, so Christ has offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Right? So this is the sacrifice that Christ makes. Right? So again, we, there's this... this uh, in verse 2, 10, ten two, for the worship once purified would have had no consequence of sins, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O oh God. So here we go. This is the fulfillment of things. He takes away the first that he may establish the second, that's the covenant. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then we have in, in, in verse 11 here, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins this is the right the the priesthood of aaron but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of god for that time waiting to his enemies are made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified but the holy spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after these day, those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. Right? So this is what we have to remember. That sacrifice has been once for all made. And when we worship in our liturgy, I mean, we worship in our liturgy, we have to remember that, uh, that, that through, I mean, the liturgy is always going on throughout the world, right? Every day it's going on, it's going on in different times and different places. But there's no, uh, right, re-sacrifice of Christ. What we're doing is participating in the one sacrifice once for all. And there's no more blood right? There's no, we don't offer blood upon the altar. What do we offer? Bread and wine. He, he, he said, this is my body. This is my blood. That is our offering. We take those things that God has made, the, the water and the wheat and those things that make the bread. And, and we take what, what make the, the grapes to make the wine. We use our energy, right? To make something out of what God has provided us. And we offer that. And that in that offering, we're actually offering our whole selves. Right, and I want to read something here. This is finishing St. John Chrysostom's thought about the priest standing at the altar, the New Testament priest, right in the church. The symbols which existed before the ministry of grace were fearful and awe inspiring. For example, the bells, the pomegranates, the stones on the breastplate, the stones on the ephod, the mitre, the diadem, the long robe, the golden crown, the holy of holies, the deep silence within. But if you consider the ministry of grace, you will find that those fearful and awe-inspiring symbols are only trivial. The statement about the law is true 
here also. The splendor that once was is now no splendor at all. It is outshone by a splendor greater still, right? This is talking about the all things fulfilled in Christ. When you see the Lord sacrificed in line before you and the high priest standing over the sacrifice and praying and all who partake being tinctured with the precious blood, can you think that you are still among men and still standing on earth? Are you not at once transported to heaven and having driven out of your soul every carnal thought? Do you not with soul naked and mind pure look round upon the heavenly things? Oh, the wonder of it. Oh, the loving kindness of God to men. He who sits above with the Father is at that moment held in your hands, or in our case today, received on a spoon, and gives himself to those who wish to clasp and embrace him, which they do, all of them, with their eyes. Do you think this could be despised or that it is the kind of thing anyone can be superior about? It goes on. This is good stuff. This is talking about our Christian worship, right? Those things that seem so beautiful in the Old Testament, they, they were just shadows. It's nothing at all. Those sacrifices, right, as great as they were, were nothing at all. That was all this, this earthly shell of something, right? God was, God was involved in the worship of Old Testament Israel, but he was leading them through the law to the fulfillment of that. And that is the worship that we participate in for ourselves and on behalf of the whole world. All right. We got a couple minutes. So somebody asked a really good question. Uh, they sent me one on, on salvation. I'm going to save it because uh, it's, it's, it's really good. But um, I hope you're learning something or really seeing this, this fulfillment, right? The book of Hebrews, you should read it. It really is all about how Christ fulfills that. And that's important, right? Because the church is, is continuing the fulfillment of Old Testament worship. If you at St. George, when you open the holy doors, we have the holy table there, the altar, the priest standing before the altar. And if you look beyond the altar in the the, the farthest east, what we call the high place, that there's a there's a, a, a image of Christ as bishop, as high priest, presiding over the liturgy that we're doing and when the bishop is present the bishop is actually the living icon that's why we sense the the bishop 21 times when he's dressed in in his in his uh in, in his vestments he functions for us not only as the bishop but functions as the icon of jesus christ to remind us that christ himself is uh presiding over over the liturgy that we do this heavenly liturgy that's described in Revelation. We just haven't got there yet. All right. Let me see. I think I, I got. Yeah, someone asked, is the goat that is sent into the wilderness the one that is sent to uh, Azazel? And that's yes. I could go more into this. There's a lot. There's a, there's a lot, right? But the point is what we're doing now, what for our salvation, how Christ fulfills all of these things. And I wanted to go over this because the next thing really is, is uh, I, I do want to talk about revelation and how revelation relates to our, our life here in the church on earth uh, and, and, our, and our worship experience because we are experiencing revelation now. I want to talk about that. And of course, uh, we're going to really start diving into the liturgy now that we have the Old Testament shadow and know how Christ is our high priest. How does that relate to what we do in, in our worship? So I'll talk a little bit also about uh, images of worship we have in the early church, um, the early descriptions of worship, and, and, but mostly talk about how the apostolic church worships uh, every Sunday today. All right, it is eight o'clock. And if you have any, any questions, uh, please send them to me. I'm going to leave. Uh, we'll leave a little bit early today. All right. God bless you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Simeon. You, You're, You're welcome. Good Thank night. You. Thank you, Father Simeon. You are welcome. Invite your friends. Bring them all.